Welcome to Rational Music, coming to you from the Captain's Lounge Studios, located right here in wonderful uptown Longmont. I have got a guest who dragged himself all the way from Denver to be here today, so I'm very happy to introduce Michael Hartsock. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks, nice to be here. Michael is, is an independent producer of music. He not only produces the music, he writes it. In fact, he does everything. So why don't I let Michael explain exactly what he's involved with? Michael. Well, I've been uh, messing around with music, I guess, for over 40 years. Um, I've done musicals when I was little and community theater and uh, choir, had some doo-wop groups in high school. So I've been doing music for a while. And I decided that I wanted to experiment and see what was involved with actually coming up with something of my own. So how, how many years have you been doing this now? Uh, as far as recording stuff, probably 20, 25 years. Okay. But then, you know, singing, being on stage, probably closer to 40. Oh, you're one of those despicable actor types, are you? Well, occasionally. Okay, so am I, so <laughs> I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you know, if, if you've been producing your own music, for what, 25, 30 years? About, yeah. A, a very approximately. Yeah. So you've yeah. seen some incredible changes Absolutely. In, in the way that this actually works. Why don't you yes. take us through a little bit of the history of what you have seen? Okay. I mean, we won't yeah. go back to when we used to put things on right. rolls. And, right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, when I, when I did my first recording, uh, I didn't have any equipment myself at all. And uh, I had come up with a lyric and melody idea, taken it to someone else, they came up with a chord progression, did some piano, took it to another place, and uh, there we put it on tape. And at that point, it was eight track, reel to reel. Yes. Uh, after that project, I decided to invest in some of my own recording equipment, and I started out with four track cassette recording. Oh my goodness. Yes, and uh, then progressed into the eight track CD recording that didn't last very long, and then went into 16 track reel to reels, mm -hmm. and now I do all my stuff on a computer. Yes, as, so, we, as we all do. Yes, so, so yeah, it's, it's changed a lot. Okay, that must be interesting. But knowing the complexities of the music world, and, and you're young enough to have seen exactly the complexities, right? because it's not like bands that started up in, say, the early 60s. They, they, they really had nothing to look back on in what they were trying to accomplish. Right, right. Bands like Floyd, Who, Yes, etc. Right. What drew you to music in the first place? I always really enjoyed listening to music, and it always felt like it took me to another place. Um, whether it was happy, sad, didn't make any difference, it could take you to another world. Um, but, but there were a couple of things that really moved me to want to be involved with music. First thing was, when I was eight years old, um, my first album was Elvis... Elvis's Golden Hits, Volume One. You poor thing. Well, yeah, <laughs> and and that that changed everything. I was like, okay, I, I like this. This is this is cool. Um, prior to that, I had gone to a high school musical when I was in second grade, and I remember seeing the kids on the stage and hearing them and seeing them interact and seeing the audience response, and thinking, wow. About this how is old powerful. Yeah. I was probably six or seven. Oh, wow. Yeah. And just, uh, it was so amazing. I can still remember that show. It, it was very, very amazing. It was Oliver, actually. Um, so great music. Um, but, uh, you know, I kind of dabbled with it after that. Mm -hmm. um, and loved listening to everything. I grew up in a house where we'd, where we'd listen to everything. You know, Blondie, Bach, Elvis, you know, Boots Randolph, whatever. Um, but uh, when I was in high school, I was in choir and theater and in track and ended up with shin splints so bad I couldn't run track anymore. And I thought, well, I guess I'll do music. And that's where it really, really <laughs> took off and I started being really involved with it. Okay, so to, to cut it down a little bit, my ankle hurts, I'm going to do music. Pretty much. I like it. That, yeah. that, that good decision. <laughs> What's my option? <laughs> 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 yeah, you see, with myself, for instance, um, being older than yourself, when I grew up, uh, my parents were heavily into classical, especially my dad. 
And he had one um, LP, Pictures of an Exhibition, Mor Morosky, that just I loved mm -hmm. because it took you through every mood. Right. I don't know whether you know the piece or not. It, not it's been done a it. couple of times by, uh, it was done by Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Oh, wow, okay. Um, as an cool. obviously electronic sure. uh, rock version, but yeah. they really stuck to it. But it was classical music that took you through every mood, and it was just wonderful. And that's what really turned me on to music as yeah. well. But then in the early 60s, of course, you had the bands that were, were doing very much um, experimental. Yes. Um, the Floyds, the Who's, the Yeses again. Mm -hmm who were out there discovering themselves, discovering what was possible. Now, when we were chatting before the show, you know, what would have happened if Moog had not invented right. that first synthesizer? Right. Today would be a totally different day. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Very, very different. Well, it's, it's interesting, not only the instrumentation, but the recording process has changed immensely. Uh, in the days of Bing Crosby uh, and the big band stuff with Glenn Miller, Everything was live, mm -hmm. and if you messed up a note halfway through, you started that track over. Um, by the time Yes had come around, uh, they were be able to cut tape and splice things. Right. Well, now you can do a, a ten-minute song in two-second clips if you want. Yes. You know, because it's all just right there, click, click, click. click. Yeah. So that's really changed that's right. a lot too. Yeah, I mean, when you when you look at recording studios through history, it is absolutely amazing. It is what they can now do. Yeah. Um, there is a fascinating video on YouTube and um, I think it was Roger Waters and David Gilmore, they talked about how they edited Dark Side of the Moon. And people think that Pink Floyd were just doing the music. No. Right. They were an integral part of the editing and all five of them, and, and I'm trying to remember who their, their producer is, uh, sorry, who their sound engineer was back then. And the name's not coming to me, and it, and it should, because he became very famous on his own. But all of them were involved. Yes. Moving stuff, twiddling stuff, stopping tape from falling down. Because yes. the way they were doing the echoes was to run the tape or actually around the, the recording studio. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Just amazing stuff, yeah. what they there, were doing. There's a, a story I really like about whenever I think I'm getting fed up with trying to edit something, I go back to this story of Yes and their... Um, I believe it was their second or third album, and they were working on Roundabout and some of mm -hmm. those breakout songs of theirs, and stories of, of John Anderson diving into the recycle bin or the, or the trash bin to try to find the piece of tape they had just cut out because that was a piece that they needed. They needed. Because you know, they were doing everything with a razor blade <laughs> at that time. So I think, well, that's not so bad when I'm clicking and dragging and having to look through a file. You that's know? true. That is very so, true. It's definitely changed. And of course, we have a recycle bin, so if worse yes. comes to the worst, you just open yes. that little puppy yes. up and whoops, there it is. <laughs> yep, exactly, exactly. <laughs> That'll save me a few times when editing video as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is how you got into music. So today, I mean, do you just write, do you just produce, or, or do you now cover the whole aspect of producing, say, a CD? Right. Uh, that's kind of a trick question because I don't claim to be able to do any of it. I just dabble with it and something happens. I think it can, I think it can get dangerous calling, yes, I'm a producer, well, what does that mean? So, you know, when it comes to my own music or some artists that I've worked with, I do. I help them write, I help them produce, record, mix, master, all the editing. Mm -hmm. um, and I really enjoy the whole process figuring out the artwork, making sure things are copywritten, are the lyrics correct, are they saying what they want to say, are you doing this album as a series of songs or as a collective? Um, something that was really big in the 60s and 70s were thematic albums. Mm -hmm. And then in the 80s and 90s, it was a bunch of singles. You had 10 individual songs that didn't really make a story, but they were all radio hits. And so there were a lot of different ways to approach it. And, uh, that's something I've gotten into where I, I enjoy the whole process from start to finish. Right. From deciding you want to do something to actually making sure the public can see it. Excellent, excellent. So really, we'll get to the music a little bit later. So really, the, the last CD here in the yes. pile is all you. Yes. Because yes. I don't think people realize the art of mixing. No, I don't think they do either. And it's... it's uh, 
it's a different it, world. It's a different world. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and it, it, it's almost like being a member of the band. Yes. Which, of course, is why you always have to have a good sound. Engineer. Yes, absolutely. Makes all the difference in Makes the world. Makes all the difference in yeah. the world. So you're also a teacher. You, you teach people how to do this. Yeah, that, kind, that, kind, that. Of a, kind of by default. I um, had run into some, some kids in high school right around 2000 who uh, had heard that I had done some things with an artist named Apostle mm -hmm. who does hip-hop stuff. A uh, good friend of mine and, and an amazing artist. And they came to me and said, well, you've worked with him. Can you work with us? And I said, well, yeah, what do you know? And they said, nothing. We, we like to rap. And, and I said, okay, that's fair enough. You know, come in, show me what you've done. Yeah. Tell me what you want and we'll figure it out. And uh, so through that process, I, I taught them all about beats, chord progressions, how to make your lyrics work correctly, mm -hmm. uh, rhyme structure, things like that. Um, and one of those artists I still work with today, and we still produce stuff together, which is great. But I, I learned that I enjoy helping other people discover um, how to do things. Right. But also, I like seeing their face when they walk home with a finished product. Yes. You know, saying, hey, I did this. Um, that, that's that's the, the difficulty, is knowing when it's done. Yes. Yeah. That is always a very fine yeah. line of, do I want to mess with this a little bit more, right. or do I draw the line here? And do you, do you I've, always, oh, sorry, I've, I've always struggled with that, because there, there are several tracks that I just decided not to put on a recording, because I messed with them so much, and I, I adjusted them and, and reworked them and everything so much that I didn't remember how they had started. And they had turned into something that I didn't want to release, because it's not what I had started with. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you do, you have to be careful. When it starts to change, you have to you know, take a break from this, come back and see if it's something I want to continue with or if it's ready. Right. Now, I know you have done musical theater mm -hmm. in the past as well. Yes. Which is, uh, which is interesting because that is very different from obviously this. Very different. Any interesting stories from theater? Because we also do a show called The Actors Take and it's always fun to hear when things go wrong. Yes. No one wants to hear about when things go right. I mean, right, that's boring. true. That's true, that's true. <laughs> they, they like walking away when things go right and go, that was a good show, but they like the stories of the things that go wrong. That's right. Uh, you got anything of interest? There's a lot of them, but uh, we were chatting a little bit before um, about uh, Tom Lewis and uh, shows well, now, hold on. A lot of people talk about Tom that's Lewis. True. Let's, let's be, let's that's be true. honest about this. That's true. And we probably have more stories than we should probably share, but well, this is one I can share. Some can't be told right. in public. Right. I mean, let's, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but Tom and I go way back, um, and we, we, it's been kind of hit and miss, you know, doing projects with each other and stuff, but we did a show uh, called Brigadoon, and... Uh, Ah, the Scottish show. Yes, and a great, <laughs> great show. And I ended up with a pretty big part in that, which was a, a first for me. Usually I'm, you know, one of the smaller parts. And uh, I lost my voice completely. Um, Oops. Like a day before one of our shows. Oh, no. And uh, I had called the music director, and I, I could barely even speak, and said, you can hear how well I can talk. I, I can't do this show. And she said, no, you have to do this show. We're sold out. And I said, okay, what's the plan? She said, call me back in 45 minutes. Get yourself ready. And uh, we'll fill you full of Sudafed. <laughs> yes, yes. So I took a whole bunch of medicine and headed down to the theater. And by the time I had gotten there, she had gotten with the rest of the cast. And uh, a gentleman who is an amazing singer and, and good stage performer as well, Don Warwick, uh, so well, I'm a I'm a tenor as well. I'll sing all your parts. You lip sync. Holy mackerel! Yeah, and so I lip synced the entire show, and all of the dialogue we did had to be adjusted where the other characters would ask me a question and I would respond to the head nod or point or whatever. Right. Um, and so I mimed the entire show, <laughs> and, and we were really fortunate because the audience was another theater company. Oh no! And so so. While they could have been very critical, they understood that things happened and they were extremely supportive. It was a really, really good show. Oh, amazing. Yeah, it was uh, terrifying, but it turned out really well. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, of course, one of the things about community theater is you very seldom have understudies. Yes. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. It's hard enough to find an actor 
to do a specific part. Right. Finding two is almost impossible. Right. I was very fortunate in that show. We had a lot of talent in that show. Yeah. So. Do, do you miss doing musical theater? Um, I miss the, believe it or not, I miss the rehearsals. I miss the creative part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I struggle walking on stage in front of people. So the performances can be a little bit daunting for me. But um, when I'm done, I'm like, well, that's great. Let's do it again. Yeah. But right before I go on stage, I'm like, I'm not going out there. So, uh, I, but I really enjoy the creative process, I'm, the rehearsing not, and stuff. I'm not quite as bad as that when I used to go out on stage, but I used to stand in the wings waiting for my opening point, nervous as hell. Yeah. People knew, yeah. don't go near Nigel. Right. But, but I think most actors <laughs> are like that yeah. because each of us gets into our little, little realm yeah. and we slowly transform ourselves into the character that we have to be. Right. As soon as those lights hit us. Right. And I, I think it's an incredible feeling. It's probably more fun than actually the performance. Yes. Yeah, it, I think it so is, too. it is such a, a, a metamorphosis of, yeah. of feelings that happen within, inside you. Yeah. It, it really is quite amazing. Yeah, it is. That's true. It really is quite amazing. So why don't we talk about your actual music itself? Because I think that's why we're really here. But right, the background right. has been absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Now, I noticed that you actually brought along... Now, what is this? I can't remember. I'm, I'm suffering from brain damage here. Right. I, I kind of remember these from about late 60s, early 70s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why don't we talk about this? Because this is your very first right, very yeah. first. That's one. A, that was my first attempt. Um, only released it on cassette. Uh, CDs were available. People were buying them, but... It was a new enough format that it was kind of pricey to do. What, what sort of year are we talking about? Uh, this here? is 1994. Okay. So, so CDs are about, what, five years old? Five yeah, years not, by now? Yeah. Approximately. About, yeah. And they were trying to recover the cost of development. Right. And so for me to, as an independent home studio, put out a CD, they were running, you know, $3 a piece. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, at that time, that was that and was more than you wanted to spend. And taking forty-five minutes to burn the blast right. of things. Right. Right. Yes. And and they were hard to get a hold of. It was just. It was. I just thought. You know, I've never done this before. I don't know what my audience is going to want. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the demand is going to be. I'm going to go as cheap as I can. Uh, and ultimately, it ended up being a, a really good release. Um, on this particular release, I wrote the lyrics and the melody. And then uh, my voice teacher, actually, at the time, sang it to her, and uh, she came up with the chord progression, did the arrangement, took it to my brother-in-law's recording studio. Uh, he had just put in a recording studio at the time uh, on 8-track reel-to-reel, and he was also a bass player. 8-track. Yes. Uh... Yes. Nothing like listening to a song and halfway through, right. clunk, clunk. <laughs> 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 yeah, so... So, uh, you know, everything was done in, in bedrooms and basements and closets and everything at the time, but it, it ended up being really good. Uh, printed 100 copies of it and sold all 100 copies in five days. Wow. And uh, pretty much called it good on that until a couple of years later, my aunt said, you know, I like this song. I think it was, I, I know somebody in the Four Corners area that works with K-Love, the radio station. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's coming up on Christmas. Let me see if they'll they'll play it. And they did, and it became their number one requested Christmas song that year. Congratulations! So so that was really cool. Uh, it didn't end up becoming a millionaire or anything, but people liked the song, and that's what I wanted. I wanted people to listen to it and like it, mm -hmm. um, for it to to feel like a Christmas song to them, um, and and not to be the same old same old. Yes. You know, I, I love traditional Christmas music, but sometimes it's nice to have Have you, have you ever different. considered putting this on CD? I have. Uh, this last year for Christmas, I re-released it um, on digital format only. Okay. But not on disc. So you could get online and get it. You could download it. Um, oh, well. Or stream it, but you Next didn't have thing. a CD. Right. Next best right. thing. I figure that's really accessible to people these days. That's right. And, because and there's the, almost no overhead. Yeah, what so. people don't realize is the quality of MP3, mm -hmm. or which I assume is what you, you'd yes. be using, yes. nowadays is equally as good as the WAV format that was used right. on CDs. Right, it's really come a long, it's long, come way. A long, yeah. long way. It's come a long, long way. It really has. Yep. And because this was all analog when it was released, 
yes. you're not going to be losing a whole lot anyway because it didn't max out all the right. You know, like the digital format where you can go to you know ninety six or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just analog. It is what it is. So, have you ever considered re-releasing that as a CD? This last year, actually, I did put it online, release it as a digital download. Ah, yeah. Okay. So I didn't uh, want to go through the process of doing the CD and the artwork and stuff, or, you know, all yeah. over for it. So I just did it as a d digital download. So, okay. Yeah. Was that successful? It did okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't Good. really push it. I just kind of threw it out there and said, "Hey, this is something you know I did." Right, and 25 years well, ago. And you know, I'm, I'm sure you're using the MP3 format. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, they have they have made such advances with MP3 format in in the compression. Yeah. That now a top end MP3 is as good as the WAV file format that they yeah. used for yeah, the it original really CDs. Really has come a long way. It has come a yeah. long, long way. And because I was, you know, this release was done on analog, reel to reel. Right. You know. It, it's Did you have any noise issues getting it into the MP3 format? Any sort of tape hiss and? No, I didn't. Um, oh, that was but lucky. I, I, um, I did do some reprocessing on it. I took the tape, dumped it to a CD, ran it through my computer, normalized it. Yes, did and then, all the, and then the, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, so I did do some re-edits on it. The normal cheating, as yes. I call it. <laughs> yes, yes. But it, it, it was a clean enough recording when we did it that there really wasn't much of an issue. More, more, as you know, if you've done any analog recording, intro and outro into the music, you hear more noise than yes, during right. the song. Yes. So you know, if you can, if you can eliminate the noise at the beginning and the end, any noise that happens during that on an analog recording, any the ambient noise to me is just a bonus. Yes. Unless it's you know, yes, things you don't want in the recording. But. Yes. So. A number of years pass. Whoa, down boy. <laughs> so time passes. About how much time until we get to your second? You know, not as much time as I thought it would take. Really? Um, I, I really thought either this is going to happen rapid fire, mm -hmm. and I've learned this process, and now I'm going to, yeah, bang. Now, now I'm going to be a genius, multi-million yes. star, you know, million, millionaire. But or it's going to take forever because I'm not going to know what to do next. Um, and it actually didn't take too long, about two years. Um, in that process, from this recording to this recording, I had gotten a four-track recorder, mm -hmm. cassette recorder. I had purchased a synthesizer. I had kind of learned how to use a th synthesizer. And so now I was able to write and do rough editing before I had to do the recording. Right. And so I could come up with ideas and go, this does or doesn't work, and, and that's how that came about. Excellent. Oh. I still have a Roland synthesizer at home that I bought in about 1972. Oh, cool. It's a really old analog, one of the original analog yeah. synthesizers. And occasionally I still dig it out yeah. and plug it all in. Yeah. Unfortunately, Great sounds. I, I was in Britain, and so it's a 240 volt one. Oh, okay. So I have to have a step up transformer gotcha, for it. Right, but, right, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. I, you can make that thing just, you could drive the whole neighborhood absolutely oh, yeah. <laughs> crazy. So, this one is called Don't You Know. So, yes. what sort of style were you aiming at? I went in a completely different direction with this one. This first release was a Christmas song, mm -hmm. um, kind of influenced by Alabama, kind of a country Oh, okay, song. country feel to it. Yeah, and Don't You Know was more influenced um, by the pop electronic sound mostly coming out of Sweden in the early 90s. So this okay. one, I kind of got an influence from Ace of Bass. Mm -hmm. And I also decided in the late 80s and, and, and through the mid 90s, most people aren't going to probably know this terminology, it was really big to have a maxi single. Yes. So you could release a song and then have five or six versions of that same song, an a cappella version, a heavy metal version, whatever you wanted to do, and take that one song in different directions. And so that's what I did with this one. So it's kind of a pop electronic, but I also did a hip hop version and a, an acid jazz version, which also was a, a different take than this one in that that one, the only thing that's synthesized mm -hmm. is the drum track. Everything else oh. I brought real musicians in for. Okay. So, um, so you know, well, so on this one, these were all real musicians, but I didn't yes. do any of the arranging. So we're going from Christmas songs yes. to, to, to acid jazz. Yes. A interesting transition there. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I, that's, I've always approached everything with whatever comes to my mind, I'm going to put it down and see what happens. See what happens, yeah. yes. Um, 
because I feel like if you try to just follow, and this is just for me, I know some artists are able to pull this off, uh, I'm not, is that if I say I want to do pop music, then either I'm not going to be able to write more than one song because I feel like I'm stuck and I don't have anywhere to go, or every song I do is going to sound just like the last one I did. Ah, yes. And so I want to have some variety. I want One thing I, I, I have always liked as a listener is to know that I'm going to like the artist because of how they approach their music, mm -hmm. but not know what I'm going to hear. So as an example, yes, mm -hmm. um, which we talked about earlier, you always knew you were going to get progressive, experimental music, but you never knew what you were going to hear as far as, are they going to be guitar-oriented, vocals? Is it going to be an a cappella introduction? Is mm -hmm. it going to be all keyboards? You never knew. You never quite knew yeah. what was coming next. Right. Um, and as far as solo artists go, um, one of my biggest influences has been George Michael. And he's very much that way. Every album he released, you knew it was going to be amazingly well produced. Mm -hmm. You knew it was going to be great music. But you didn't know what he was going to do. Is it going to be big band oriented, more pop? more jazz, right. is he going to have a vocalist with him or is he going to do all the vocals? Mm -hmm. And so that's how I approach my music is just what's, what happens in my head, put it down, is it good, then I can release it. Yeah, I've got a, an interesting little story about Yes. About uh, four or five years ago, Yes were touring the United States and my mm -hmm. son went mm -hmm. to the Yes concert in Aspen Oh yeah. in a small club yes. of 60 people. That would have been amazing. I still want to kill him. Right. <laughs> yeah, they are. They are. They are amazing. Uh, yeah, one of my favorite bands. Right. I hate to think what we're going to move on to when yeah. this was acid rock as well. I right. love the photograph on the cover. Thank you. It's, it's just it's that that is really really it, nice. very 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 different. And and on a side note on this too, going back to knowing Tom for a while, he and I did a music video for this in 1996. Oh. Um, and we've played with the idea of revisiting that video, but uh, that, that was also the first music video I did. So in a very short time, I went from just singing with a cappella groups to recording and producing and, and then helping, uh, you know, nice. work on a, on a music video. So, nice. Yeah. So we now move again into the future. Mm -hmm. This has, what, 1996 to 2000? Oh, I see. So this is a collection. Yes, yes. This is a collection. So... I had... I hate to think what style of music. Well, dare I ask? Yeah, on, on this one there are a lot of different styles. Uh, there's kind of some pop ballads. Um, there's a ambient electronic piece that almost doesn't feel like it's in regular time, uh, which a friend and I had written together. Uh, there's a really dark... Um, I don't know exactly how to explain it. It was influenced by George Michael. Uh, on a piece that he had done where he, his drum track in the song never changed through the whole song. There, oh. were, there weren't any fills, it just was this continuous drum track, but all the other stuff changed around it. I thought, oh, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did something like that on, on this as well. And then there's an industrial piece on it. Oh. So yeah, it's, <laughs> and, and that's why it's called a collection. Um, I, I hadn't had an idea for, a, for an album, but I had five or six songs that I thought were good enough to put together to give a flavor of what I had been working on. Right. So. I, I still have trouble dealing with industrial. There, I, yeah. I really have trouble, because I am listening to the backtrack of it. Right. Th where I am hearing some superb guitar, sure. drum, bass work going on, yes. and it's ruined by some idiot singing. Right, <laughs> right. There, you know, industrial is an interesting style. Uh, because I, I would largely agree with what you just said. Most of the time, the vocals ruin it, and there's this great stuff going on in the background. I um, have listened to artists like Front 242, Netzareb, Ramstein, Nine Inch Nails, where they're master producers and engineers with their, with their stuff, too. Yes. And I think that makes a huge difference. A lot of the industrial stuff is just loud and then somebody decides to put some vocals on top of it. And I feel like the in industrial groups that I've listened to and, and used for influence, um, the message had to stand out without the music. Yes. And the vocals had to be able to stand on their own. And uh, so that's how I tried to approach, approach it on mine. Okay, yeah, it, sometimes it can just become noise. 
which I think is true in every every genre. But. That that is very true, yeah. but you know, yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll move away from this <laughs> subject. That's interesting. I'm going to have to listen to that track. I'm, I'm dying to hear what exactly right. what you did. <laughs> We're now going to come to yes. your latest release. Yes. So why don't you hold this and why don't All you tell right. us about it? All right. Eclectic. Uh, Sixteen years between the faces of an eclectic. Um, and uh, these tracks span, I think the oldest track on this was 1995, mm -hmm. and then up to the month it was released. Um, yeah, I needed a track, and so I wrote a little instrumental track because I needed something to fill out the album. Mm -hmm. uh, and this kind of goes through, it's not quite as diverse stylistically as the faces of, but the title is very much what the music is. It's very eclectic. There's, um, it's about half instrumental and half with vocals, and the vocals that are on it vary greatly. One is spoken word, mm -hmm. uh, one is actually singing, one is kind of a mix. Uh, some, two of these tracks I actually had originally written and produced for someone else and they decided that it wasn't quite what they were looking for as far as their, their project. And since I had done all the writing on it, I said, well, that's fine. I'll just do some more tweaking on it and put it on my album. I'm the copyright yeah. holder. I'll yeah. just have that one yeah. come back home. <laughs> which, which is interesting because that's happened with a lot of, ba uh, a lot of bands. Mm -hmm. uh, Owner of a Lonely Heart, biggest hit for, for Yes, was actually written for a different band. Yes. And, you know, they re reproduced it and it ended up being their biggest hit. Um, George Michael, same thing, one of one of his biggest hits. He was writing for someone else and the synthesizer, mm -hmm. as, as you know in the 80s sometimes the synthesizers, if it, the polyphony on them would allow you to use more than 36 notes in a measure or whatever and if you did it would start kicking sounds out mm -hmm. and you never knew what that was going to do and that happened to him and it created a sound that he thought, well, I can't use that for this guy. I've got to use this for me. And so uh -huh. he rearranged the song and, and created his own hit. And so that's kind of how some of this came about okay. as well. Most yeah. interesting. Where can people find your music online? I This particular release, I did hard copy and digital download, but I'm not archiving any of the hard copies myself, which I've done in the past. I've had 100 CDs sitting in my closet or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they can go to CD Baby. And, and buy digital download or the CD, um, which is cool because you know maybe they only like one track on the album, or maybe they like three tracks on the album. They don't have to buy the whole thing, they can download what they want. Or maybe they find one track they really love and they want to buy it 10 times. Ooh, that would be yeah, fine too. Would be fine as absolutely. well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I know that there are people out there who are like I am who want the, the art. Yes. And they want the liner notes. And so then they can get the CD and, and have that to, to reference, which is cool as well. Yeah. And I think liner notes are really important. It's actually, we should, yes. you know, I, it's a dying art. It is. LP art mm -hmm. is a dying Absolutely. art. Absolutely. But I've got LPs at home where the liner notes go on for page yes. after page after page with photographs and concerts. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's all missing now. It is. It's and you learn a missing. lot about the artist and about the time. Because it yes. really is a reflection of, of the times and, you know, the way it's put together really shows, oh, this was, you know, this yes. this decade. What was that website again? Uh, CDBaby.com. CDBaby.com. Yeah. You can also find it on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube. Um, You're everywhere we look. Pretty much. When it comes to music. Yes. 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 That is good. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Michael. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about at the moment, or should we call this one a wrap? What do you think? You know, we could go for days and days. Yeah, we probably this, could. This is probably a pretty decent stopping point. Rush out and buy it, folks. Rush out and buy it. Michael, thank you so, thank so you. much for coming up fun. from Denver to do this interview. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Having thank you, you here in the Captain's Lounge studios. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. That was Rational Music with Michael. I want to thank you all for watching this video, and we will see you next time. From the Captain's Lounge Studio, I'm Nigel Aves, your host, signing off. Goodbye.